We have called this event a kickoff workshop, and here's what it means. We, a group of like-minded philosophers, together with students who have joined our prop art seminar, have started research on the significance of proprioception, the bodily senses in art. We have just begun, and so everything truly has a workshop character. If you, the speakers, as I will do, present work and progress with open questions and loose ends, this is very welcome. We are very lucky to have won a great group of speakers, philosophers, art historians, psychologists. We have Jiri Binovsky, we have Svetlana Chernichova, Ksenia Fedorova, Corinna Kühnapfel, and I'm afraid to say Hanna Lorek had to cancel her talk on short notice. I'll refer to the program later what we do instead in her slot. We have Juliane Zetsche, we have Charles Spence speaking, Ludger Schwarte, Markus Schrenk, that's me, by the way, and Barbara Montero. And now everyone is lined up in alphabetic order. Now these tiles you see here, and which some of you might know from Instagram and Twitter, are a good opportunity for me to introduce the group members to you. Because the tiles and the workshop poster have been designed by Julia Frese, who's sitting over there. Uh, and who is also, also responsible for the project's PR and the advertising. Till Bödecker has designed the typo on the tiles, which you also find on our website, which he also designed. <laughs> and Till is also responsible for the sound and vision uh, for the next three days here. Isabel Kessels has acquired the funding for this workshop and has, in general, been responsible for correspondences and background organization. And this is the point where I wish to thank our funding bodies. This is, on the one hand, the German Research Foundation, DFG, and the German Society for Analytic Philosophy, uh, GAP. Thanks to them, to all of you at DFG and GAP for the, for the funding uh, for, this, for this workshop. Now, finally, here's Juliane Zetsche, who has, for example, made possible the visit uh, to K21, the museum we are going to vi visit this afternoon. And there's also in the background, but right now here in the conference room, Eva Kellner, our administrator, without whom nothing would be possible here. So thanks, Eva, for, for the background, all the background work. Now, this is our program, which you will have seen online as well. Uh, let me refer to it only briefly. We have registered already. We, at least here in the audience, had lunch. And this is my welcome note to you. Afterwards, I will give a short, brief introduction to what is proprioceptive art or is proprioceptive art possible. We have a coffee break and then the talk by Charles, Charles Spence, Proprioceptive Pleasures. Afterwards, everyone here joining us at Heinrich Heine University will go to the museum K21 to visit Zaratzeno's net. Uh, so be up for a proprioceptive experience in person. Afterwards, we have a conference dinner. Um, we have a couple of spare places. So the speakers are invited, of, of course, but also for the audience. If you'd like to join us, ask the organizers and we might be able to make a, a space possible for you at the restaurant. Now, as you know, this um, will also be streamed online right now on YouTube, and uh, there are many uh, of you already in Zoom joining us. Now, here's the Thursday program. Thursday sees a lot of talks, beginning with Jiri Binovsky, Erotic Art as Proprioceptive Art, Ksenia Fedorova, Distributed Self, Artistic Tactics of Sensing Across and Beyond the Body Boundaries, all with lunch breaks and coffee breaks in between, Svetlana Chernyshova on Bodies in Motion, an activist reflections on art and its shift, shifts in understanding the context of proprioception. Hanna, as I said, can't join us, unfortunately. We thought we keep the program as it is, um, especially for the online audience, so that there are no uh, hiccups. But we will have, we open up Zoom for an open discussion. So this is an open discussion slot instead of Hanna Lorek's talk. And on that day, finally, Barbara, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to click her away. Barbara Montero will give her her talk. 
Friday sees three more talks, three further talks by Ludger Schwarte, Proprioception, Aesthetic versus as uh, Artistic Practice, then Juliane Zetsche on Proprioception in Visual Art, and finally Corinna Kühnapfel, Empirical Aesthetics for Installation Art. Now, of course, after every talk, we have Q&A sessions. For those of you who are in Zoom, please write a Q into the chat, um, thereby we know who asks which question at which point, um, and uh, we, we keep the, the, the list in, in order. Um, please write a Q. If it's not possible for you to use your audio, then you, of course, can type your question, but we prefer here, the organizers, if you ask the question via, via your audio function. And people inside this room just raise your hands as, as usual, of course. And uh, by the way, the speakers and also the chairs uh, and everyone who's asking a question in the audience, you may take off your mask, of course. Otherwise, during the workshop, please keep them on. Um, another exception is the lunch breaks and coffee breaks, of course. Oh, one point, I asked the chairs to be very strict with, uh, with time organization. So if, in case um, they should not uh, be able to take your question, uh, please, um, please forgive them, forgive us for chairing very strictly uh, because we want to keep the program um, uh, in, in time for, the, for those of you who are joining us online. Uh, this is important to keep the timetable. Here's a note on COVID. Um, so let me pre briefly remind you, people here inside the room, that we, the organizers, wish uh, everyone attending that they are vaccinated, have received their booster shot, and please test yourselves daily as we all do. We ourselves won't check these very tight rules, but at the entrance of the building, uh, you will be asked to uh, show your uh, pass or, or your negative, your negative test. Finally, as I said already, um, wear your mask throughout the workshop unless you are the speaker or the chair or you ask a question during the Q&A session. Now, if you have any questions um, regarding the program, um, please feel free to ask them now, here or in the chat. Um, and I hope I haven't forgotten anything. I look at the other organizers. Maybe you have something that I should mention as well. Well, in that case, I guess we can really start the workshop. So without further ado, I will start with the question, what is proprioceptive art? Now, intuitively, I guess, we have a clear sense of what visual arts are. Some paintings or photography are examples. Here's Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. We also, we also have a clear intuition what auditory arts are. Here I have a picture of uh, um, uh, Thomas Ardes and uh, uh, Ian Bostrich performing the Winterreise by Schubert. And of course there are intermediate cases of auditory arts and visual arts. Here is a picture of an opera by Philip Glass, his first opera, Einstein on the Beach, produced by Robert Wilson. So opera, ballet, dance performances, theater are intermediate cases. They would be categorizable under, under visual art and auditory art. And of course, there are such cases where paintings, visual art, induces bodily sensations. Here I have a picture by Bridget Riley, op art. It might induce nausea or, or vertigo when you look at these paintings, so bodily sensations. And one of our speakers, Juliana Zetsche, will target paintings like, like this, proprioception in visual art. We also have the case where auditory arts, music, include bodily sensations because they not only have hearable, audible, audible um, uh, sounds, but also subsonic sounds. So in techno music or in ambient drone music, that this kind of music will target not only your ears, but also your stomach. So even in auditory arts or in visual arts, proprioceptions, the bodily senses, will be targeted, of course. 
But still, I think that we have clear cases of visual art and clear cases of auditory art. Or let me put it this way. Mona Lisa is clearly not a piece of music, is not an auditory art. And uh, Schubert's Winterreise is clearly not visual art, to put it the other way around. Now, this is visual arts and auditory arts are not our interest, of course, here today. Our concern is proprioception or quite generally the bodily senses. And here is David Armstrong from his book Bodily Sensations giving us a couple of examples what we mean by bodily senses. We mean by bodily sense, we perceive that our legs are moving, that our head is turned, that our arm is behind our back, that we are keeping our balance, that our body temperature is up, our ears cold, stomach distended, our gut full, our throat dry, our heart beating, our muscles tensed or relaxed. And he ends this quote, and all the other things that we discover about the current state of our body without recourse to sight, hearing, taste, smell, or touch. And these are the senses we are concerned with in this conference. But not only us. I mean, it would be kind of an, an autistic interior uh, 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 enterprise if only we were concerned with the bodily senses, but the whole artwork, art, art world is concerned with the bodily senses. Here are a couple of examples from recent years. Amanda Williams had an exhibition at MoMA New York called The Embodied Sensations. And this exhibition creates a shared understanding of what experiences are like through shared sensations or body embodied experiences. Or here are slides uh, at the Tate Modern by Carsten Höller. And Carsten Höller says on the Tate Modern website, the test site, the name of this, this artwork, isn't just in the turbine hall, but it is also to an extent in the slider who is stimulated by the slides, a site within your body, you, you could add, we could add. And coming further to Oh, Charles Spence, uh, one of our speakers, will talk about uh, Carsten Höller, I, I, I believe. And coming closer to home, uh, there is our very own Till Bödecker with his artwork Think Outside the Box. This is a sensory deprivation tank where you float in salty water and you are deprived of all the outer Aristotelian senses and the only senses almost which are uh, still triggered are your internal senses. So you're thrown back onto your own proprioceptions, onto your own um, bodily senses. So the artwork is currently, art world is currently full of proprioceptive, what we are going to call proprioceptive art. But what is it? What is proprioceptive art? Now, here's an agenda for the rest of my talk. We have to be a bit clearer uh, on what sense or what senses proprioception or the bodily senses are. Our main task will be to explicate what proprioceptive art is. And, um, and uh, in passing, we will touch some, uh, uh, some, uh, some, we will have some words on the concept of art in general and also touch upon some ontological questions uh, about, about art. And finally, we uh, may uh, discuss some open questions and observations um, we have made throughout. Now, I start, of course, with one. We need to specify what sense proprioception is. Now, here's something. We use the word proprioception referring to its Latin original, proprius, one's own, and recipere, to receive, as an umbrella term. So when we talk about prop art, we don't only talk about proprioception narrowly speaking, as psychologists or neuroscientists speak, um, but we mean everything of the three following uh, uh, perceptions. Proprioception narrowly conceived, interoception, and the vestibular system. Now, what are these three? Proprioception narrowly conceived is our perception of the position of our own limbs, from inside, not by vision, of course, or our posture, our body's spatio-structural extension, our muscle tension. These are the perceptions 
which are called proprioception in the literature. And of course, to process the first four, we have to have a body image, a schema. This is necessary, a necessary precondition to correctly process information about the above. Now here's what interoception is. Interoception is the label for pains, itches, thermal sensations, sensations of orgasms, etc. Or the properties of the viscera, so the respiratory, the gastrointestinal, the cardiovascular organs. The awareness of our energy and stress level, heartbeat, shortness of breath, indigestion, etc. So this is what bears the label interoception usually. And finally, the vestibular system located in our inner ear, that is the sense organ, which um, is your sense of equilibrium. It, uh, it uh, uh, registers gravitation. Also, the spatial orientation of your body, mainly your head, and your movements, accelerations, or when you stop, is registered there in the vestibular system. And all these, proprioception, interoception, and the vestibular system, we have under the umbrella term, well, bodily sensations would have been a better term, but prop art is such a nice word that we decided to keep proprioception as the, as the umbrella term, at least for the kind of art we are concerned with. Now you will have realized that bodily senses are no single organ. There must be multiple sensors for, uh, for all these for all these perceptions which I have listed beforehand. This is different from vision, where the eye is responsible for, for vision, uh, and audition, where we have one single organ, namely the, namely the ear. Here we have a lot of sensors, evolved, of course, evolutionary evolved detector mechanisms that signal to the central nervous system. We have nociceptors, thermoceptors, osmoreceptors, etc., etc. So there are different organs, if we call these receptors, organs. And also, um, there's a sensitivity to a range of different physical properties. For vision, we just have electromagnetic waves. For audition, it's sound waves. But here we have a, a range of physical properties that are, that are uh, detected. Inertial motion, heat, pressure, change in tissue structure, chemicals, etc. But there is a unifying factor. But before I come to the unifying factor, all these detections, all these um, perceptions come with a very specific phenomenology. And of course, uh, as it is somehow to see red, for example, it is somehow to feel a toothache, etc. So we have uh, very spe specific phenomenologies linked to these kind of perceptions. Now, here's the unifying, the unifying aspect. It all happens inside our body. Okay, that's the unifying factor. What is perceived or sensed are states and events within a very special physical object, and that object is your own body. Okay, that's the unifying factor. Now, having clarified what we mean, what I mean by proprioception, broadly speaking, we can now move on to proprioceptive art and define or explicate what that is. Now here's a finger exercise first. What is visual art? How would we define visual art as a finger exercise? Here again our, our example, Mona Lisa. Now if you were, were to wear uh, noise-canceling headphones while looking at this picture, you would still perceive the painting. You would still perceive the artwork. It might disturb you, it might enhance your perception of the artwork, I don't know. But you would certainly not say, sorry, I can't perceive the artwork anymore. That's different when you're blindfolded. When you stand blindfoldedly in front of Mona Lisa, you cannot perceive the artwork anymore. Vision is essential to see, well, to see, to, to perceive the artwork. Without vision, this is not possible. So vision is, for visual arts, is somehow essential. And this is what I write into a tentative explication of visual art. This is really just finger exercise. Don't pinpoint me down on, on this, on this definition, right? A work of art is a visual artwork if and only if seeing this work of art is essential for its proper appreciation. Okay. Just as an intuition shortcut. 
Same, same works for uh, audition, of course, and maybe the same works for proprioceptive art. A work of art is prop art, if and only if, proprioceiving it, bodily sensing it, this work of art is essential for its proper appreciation. And I think this is not so bad, and we will end up with this definition again. But it takes some detours, it takes a long detour, and this is the main uh, part of my of my talk. So here's the detour. It's a mouthful. Don't don't be worried. I I explain each and every step of this tentative explication of prop art. Now I just read it and then go through each and every line. Something X is the realization of a proprioceptive artwork if and only if X is a performance, an artifact, a participation, participation or a combination thereof, which, first, appeals essentially, indirectly or directly, to some degree or a lot, to its recipient's bodily senses. And that X, that something X, of course, has to qualify as a word, as a work of art. Otherwise, it's mere proprioception, but it's not a work of art. So it has to qualify as a work of art, or the long version, by some preferred art theory, the realization, it has to be a realization of a, of a work of, of art. Okay, now, as you will have seen, there are a lot of footnotes on this, on this tentative explication, and here's what these footnotes mean. I start with qualifies by some preferred art theory as a realization of a work of art. So, by some preferred art theory. And this is where, by the way, here's my agenda again. This is, by the way, where we say something about the concept of art in general. But what I will do today is I will outsource the problem, okay? I simply adopt as a working hypothesis, hypothesis institutionalism as a theory of art. What does institutionalism say? Institutionalism says this. A work of art is an artifact, a performance, participation, etc., upon which some society or some subgroup of a society, that could be curators, galleries, museums, art critics, etc., who have conferred the status of candidate for appreciation to, um, to that, that piece of work, to this artifact. Now, if that happens, one and two, if it's an artifact and some society, some gallery, let's say, has conferred the status of candidate for appreciation on it, then it counts as a work of art. Now, mind you, this is a working, my working hypothesis is institutionalism. We could argue for other theories of art and implement them here, but I outsource the problem uh, and don't define together proprioceptive art. I'd define art, and then I'd define what would make it proprioception, pro proprioceptive art. Okay, So I think when we want to define proprioceptive art, we can outsource this, this problem. And my choice was institutionalism. By the way, here put forward by Dicky, but uh, Ludger Schwarte, who will give a talk on Friday and is in the audience, um, uh, is a proponent of institutionalism, at least some kind of, uh, Ludger, you will um, correct me if, if, if this is not right, but I, I, I believe so. Now, uh, tentative explication, where, where are we? Um, I said something about our concept of art. Now let me talk about ontology. What kind of entity is a work of art? So I'm looking at, at this first line, realization of a proprioceptive artwork. Why do I say this? Uh, so here are ontological questions. Now again, I will adopt a working hypothesis, outsource the problem again, but before I come to this working hypothesis, let me uh, point this out. There seem to be works of art, seem to be works of art, paintings, sculptures, etc., that belong to the realm of spatio-temporal material things. One would, would think that Mona Lisa, as it is hanging in the, uh, as it hangs in the, in, in the Louvre, is the work of art, that very painting. It's natural to think that, that. Other artworks, like music or literature, 
are more likely to be abstract arts. These works live as platonic ideas, but they can be realized in concrete concerts or in concrete performances or in concrete prints, books. They can be realized there, but they can be multiply realized. And so it is, it is intuitive to say they are like types and they can be tokened a couple of times. Now you can put forward this kind of dualism Okay, and say that different artworks belong to different ontological categories, but um, there are also monisms, and I will adopt abstract monism, which says that even paintings are abstract. Well, the, the artwork is abstract, and a painting is just an exemplar, is a realization of that kind of artwork. We can go into that uh, during the Q&A sessions, but again, I would like to adopt abstract monism as the theory, the ontological theory behind my definition of proprioceptive art. It has been put forward, for example, by Greg Curry, uh, who might be in the audience as, as well, and Maria Reicher, uh, from whom I copied this uh, bibliography. Okay, uh, further on this uh, abstract, abstract monism, which says that any artwork is an abstract thing and it can be realized in physical things or in performances, in concerts, etc. As I said, I want to outsource this problem. I said that already. And here's my reason for adopting that kind of ontological theory. The reason is, quite generally, ontological parsimony and unity, we just have one type of entity, which is an artwork, okay? But here's a more specific reason. Prop art comes in many artistic forms. Realizations can be installations. We will visit um, Zarasino's net this afternoon. I think that is a proprioceptive artwork. And it's, uh, it's realized, one exemplar, one realization is in the K21. But other, other, um, um, Proprioceptive artworks are realized in performances or as participations, etc. And I think that uh, Svetlana uh, will uh, focus on, on these many different kinds of, of uh, proprioceptive artworks. At least this is what I have taken from her abstract. Now, here's a, another reason why abstract monism is attractive for my definition, because we can then speak of author intended realization conditions of artworks. Artworks are abstract objects, they have to be realized somehow, and the artist, the author of the artwork, can also decide how they are to be realized. So Leonardo certainly did not think that Mona Lisa has to be realized in sound, but as oil on canvas so that it can be seen. So the realization conditions the intended realization conditions can be inscribed um, into the abstract entity and uh, thereby we have reference to senses that are intended to be affected by the realization of the artwork. So that is an advantage for my story about proprioceptive art. So what I will say is that to be works of proprioceptive art, their proper realization must involve or affect the bodily senses. This is a short version. Okay, final line uh, uh, when it comes to my tentative explication. I say that essentially, directly or indirectly, to some degree, it has to target the recipient's bodily senses. Okay, what do I mean by essentially? Well, as with our finger exercise for visual art, the visual senses, our eyes, have to be involved essentially, and that's the same here. The artwork, well, it, it belongs to the adequate realization conditions of the artwork that its realizations affect, affect the recipient's bodily senses. Or put in counterfactual form, if we were to take away the according bodily sensations, we would not perceive a crucial part of, hence essentially, of the realization of that artwork, okay? If you stand blindfoldedly in front of Mona Lisa, you don't see the artwork. You can appreciate it, of course, by thinking about Mona Lisa or talking about Mona Lisa, but you can't appreciate the artwork with the intended sense. And that is the case for proprioceptive art with proprioceptions. If you would, were to take them away, the bodily senses, you would not perceive a crucial part of it.
So that is what I mean by essentially. Now, who's the authority who says what is essential when we look at an artwork? And again, I outsource this problem and I, I adopt as a working hypothesis author intentionalism. Who's the authority? What kind of artwork it is? Which senses should be triggered by the realization? Well, the artist, of course. Who else? Well, who else? Here are alternatives. The recipients could decide. You, the audience, could decide. You could decide Mona Lisa is a wonderful auditory piece. I always go visit the Louvre to hear other people talk about Mona Lisa. That's the greatest artistic part about Mona Lisa. Fair enough, you can do so. Um, but was this intended by Leonardo da Vinci? Probably not. The in author's intention is that it has to be seen, this, this artwork. Also, art critics could be the people who decide, etc. But I believe that author intentionalism has a, has a point to it. Maybe a note in, bra in brackets at this point, which is important, um, which I haven't got on the slides. Art is not a natural kind. Defining what gold is or what an, a quark is or an electron, there you might find necessary and sufficient conditions for natural kinds. I believe there are natural kinds, but this is a different issue. And those you can define. Artworks are socially constructed entities to a high degree. So it's up to us to, to make definitions. And they should be practically useful. And I believe that this go for author intentionalism is the most useful thing to do here. I'm not claiming that I have seen the platonic idea of what art is and who the author is. There's no discovery here I claim to have made. It's just claiming, look, if we go for this thesis, other things work out well. So that's my, that's my general uh, tendency when it comes to defining art or defining um, proprioceptive art. Right? It's just a pragmatical, to a huge degree, it's a pragmatical choice. Okay, what do I mean by indirectly or directly? I believe that art can be both directly and indirectly proprioceptive. Here's uh, an, an example. Um, I, I'll leave that aside. When adequately engaging with Höller's slides, that is, by sliding down the slides yourself, we directly proprioceive and interoceive, and our vestibular system registers that we are kind of falling when sliding down the slides. So, Sliding down the slides affects immediately, directly, your proprioceptive senses, your, inter your muscles, tension, um, your interoceptive senses, uh, maybe heat because of the friction, uh, and also the vestibular system, directly. Release op art, which I had as an example for visual art, triggering proprioceptions might be an indirect proprioceptive artwork because vision mediates the proprioceptions. So if it, if it triggers vertigo in you or um, nausea, then these are pro bodily sensations which are triggered by vision. So that would be, and if it is essential, if Bridget really wanted those proprioceptions to be caused, then it's also a proprioceptive artwork. It's of course also a visual artwork, right? These categorizations are not one and only categorizations. You might cross-categorize. So op art might be predominantly visual art, but also proprioceptive art. Okay. Here's another kind of indirect proprioception, the firing of mirror neurons while watching, for example, dance. Right? If you're not the dancer yourself, but you're watching dancers, have danced yourself maybe previously, have some experience, then your mirror neurons will fire and um, will uh, give you indirect proprioceptions as, as well. Okay, I, I have ta um, talked about this al already. It has to be essential, even if it's indirect, it has to be essential. Otherwise, it's no proprioceptive part. If you can, if it's just a byproduct, an accidental byproduct, as I would think that the noises other uh, museums um, visitors make while looking at Mona Lisa. That's an, that's an auditor, an, an accidental auditory input. It doesn't belong ex essentially to the, to that visual kind of artwork. 
Now, what do I mean by some degree? Actually, I don't only mean by some degree, but here's a huge spectrum. I believe that art can be all that. To some degree, very much, predominantly, and maybe even only proprioceptive. So this is, is a spectrum. It is just important that, that essentially it is to some degree proprioceptive. If it's not, it's not proprioceptive art. So some degree has to be implemented, but then it can be all that. Very much, predominantly, maybe even only proprioceptive, no other senses involved. Maybe such artworks exist. Her slides are maybe predominantly and directly prop art, while Vile's paintings are only to some degree and only indirectly prop art. So these are attributes, direct, indirect, and the degree uh, are attributes that can be attributed to proprioceptive art. The essential part is the essential part. Okay. Um, this is what I say here, that it's essentially uh, that, that some bodily senses are involved. Okay, um, so having gone through all this, uh, these parameters, we can have an abbreviated explication. An artwork X is a proprioceptive artwork if and only if. And note, I have outsourced the problem of defining art already. I say now, an artwork X, it's already agreed it's an artwork. It's in, it's in a museum, okay? It's already there. We agree it's an artwork. And it is a proprioceptive artwork if and only if it appeals essentially to its recipient's bodily senses. So without having triggered your bodily senses, you don't perceive a crucial part, an essential part of the artwork. And as I said, that might be directly or indirectly, and it might come in degrees, mainly, predominantly, only. And in the background, we have accepted institutionalism in saying what artworks are, which entities X belong to the realm of artworks. We have adopted author intentionalism. Who is to say which perceptions are essential, which senses? Well, the artist is. And I have adopted ontic abstract monism, which says that artworks are abstract objects being realized in concrete objects or being realized in performances, in concerts, etc. Okay, now all this is tentative still. I welcome your counterexamples and I welcome your suggestions to make that um, explication or definition better. Now, do I have time for open questions. I don't, I'm afraid, uh, but here are uh, some, some examples I wanted to consider. This is the gnat we are going to visit. It's in a museum, so it is art by institutionalism. Is it essentially proprioceptive? Well, we would have to ask Saracino, of course, for, insti uh, for, for um, institu- Sorry, this means that I still have 30 minutes. Oh yeah, of course. We are at 30 minutes now. And Excellent, I started at quarter past. Wonderful. Okay, I've got time. <laughs> um, so uh, I already we already established this is art. The net which we are going to visit is art because it's an object for appreciation in a museum. Is it proprioceptive art? We would have to ask the artist Saracino whether he intends that something bodily is going on essentially, and I guess he would not deny this. Just looking at the net, you see part of the artwork. You perceive part of the artwork, but not the full thing. You have to experience it yourself. You have to go and walk into the net to uh, see the full thing. So it might be partially also visual art, okay? But for it to be proprioceptive art, it is necessary to walk into the net yourself. Or here is The White Bouncy Castle by Dana Kaspersen, William Forsyth and Joel Ryan, uh, Deichtorhall in Hamburg. Again, institutionalism, okay, it's a museum. Um, and you are supposed to uh, jump on this bouncy castle as the audience and not just look at it. So you are supposed to experience your body, uh, how your muscles, stomach, core body muscles must be tense in order not to topple over. Uh, it will trigger your vestibular system, etc. And uh, as a final uh, um, uh, example for proprioception, dance, and dance is of course in the institutions, but here it is 
important, um, unless you focus on mirror neurons, that you are the dancer yourself. Okay, and this is what Barbara Montero has has focused a lot um, on. Uh, here, this is her old uh, talk title. It has it has changed, but proprioceptive art of choreography. When you are at at least when you are the dancer yourself, then dance is a proprioceptive or can be a proprioceptive artwork. So these were examples for that class of artworks. Now, we discuss open questions and observations, and I do have time because I thought I had started at, at one o'clock. Okay, here's a problem I have with my definition. The problem of emotions. Emotions are not problematic, or some are, but, but here's my problem with emotions. Any kind of artwork might author intentionally and essentially provoke emotions, joy, pleasure, disgust, fear, etc. Now, emotions are or cause bodily reactions. That depends on your theory of emotions, but they are or cause bodily reactions and thereby proprioceptions, interoceptions, vestibular system maybe is triggered by emotions. But then, any kind of artwork might intentionally, essentially, indirectly, via the emotion it causes, and to some degree invoke bodily sensations. And if so, all art is proprioceptive art. It's a slippery slope. Almost any artwork is proprioceptive artwork. And how can we avoid this? Why would I want to avo avoid this? Well, if everything is proprioceptive art, then the notion of proprioceptive art doesn't have any bite anymore. So I think it would be better if we could somehow bracket emotions. We might just say, we might do that in saying indirect is okay, indirect proprioception, except for emotions. That might be a very ad hoc move to, to, to make. Um, here's the ad hoc solution. Or just say we exclude, after all, all indirect proprioceptions. An artwork is only proprioceptive if the proprioceptive bodily senses are directly triggered. That would be a solution. But I don't know whether it's a good solution. Or concede that almost every artwork is indirectly a proprioceptive artwork and be concerned only with direct prop art as a subject of investigation. Uh, that would be a possibility too. But maybe you have uh, some further ideas how to deal with that problem. Now, when we focus on proprioceptive art, let's say on direct, predominant pro proprioceptive art, the question arises, uh, why is there, why is there now such a focus on these arts? If I'm correct to categorize, uh, the net, uh, Saracino's net and her last slides and the embodied, um, uh, sensations exhibition, etc. If I, if I'm correct to categorize this as proprioceptive art, why now? Why does this happen now? And why have vision and uh, audition have such a predominance in, in art? Why is that so? So in our daily lives and the art world, the sense of sight and sound has been primarily appealed to. So why has this been so would be the, the question. And yet the art world, the inclusion of uh, proprioceptive elements is currently en vogue. Why is this so now is, uh, is an interesting question to ask. Um, and empirical studies might help here. So Corinna Kühnapfel with her uh, talk Empirical Aesthetics for Installation Art um, has also empirical studies on that kind of, of artwork. So that might help us to understand uh, why now or what people think of proprioceptive art. Demarcation could be a problem. Um, is architecture proprioceptive art? After all, you are guided through a building by where the stairs are located, um, where the entrances are, etc. Could massage be uh, proprioceptive art? And I think, yes, sure, both. I mean, look at institutionalism again, if it is within the museum's context, why not? And also, I said, it can be on a spectrum to some degree or predominantly proprioceptive. So architecture is to some degree proprioceptive and massage might well be dominant, predominantly um, an artwork if it is performed in museums or like Jiri Binovsky will um, talk about, about erotic art as proprioceptive art 
which is probably uh, um, predominantly proprioceptive. Now, our self-image, we are talking about bodily senses and the lived embodied experience of being in the world is crucially a proprioceptive experience. Being in the world is a bodily exercise. And so the bodily senses are central to this, to this feeling of being in the world. And thus, proprioceptive artworks might therefore be uniquely suitable to shake our self-image and stretch the boundaries for our concepts of ourselves. So when you, you might ask yourself the following question. We are much better trained to speak about our visions and visual art can be, might, uh, that's an intuition, can be much more complex than proprioceptive artworks. Now, even if that is the case, there is space for proprioceptive art because it can target our self-image, stretch the boundaries for our concept of self. So there, there is intuitively also a, a great space for proprioceptive art. And in her talk, um, Distribute Itself, Artistic Tactics for Sensing Across and Beyond the Bodily Boundaries, Ksenia Fedorova will talk about these uh, ex extensions of the, of the self in, in artworks. Now, I do have even time to talk about something, about the peculiar privacy of the bodily senses. Now, you might think that the bodily senses, and you would be right, you might think that the bodily senses are more private than other senses are. But we have to be careful. Your visual sensation, I can't have your visual sensations either. And I can't have your auditory sensations either. So what you hear when you listen to Winterreise or what you see when you see um, Mona Lisa is also private to you. So the bodily senses are no exception in this respect. But there is a privacy to the bodily senses, a peculiar privacy. And David Armstrong makes it, makes it fairly clear what it is. There is a peculiarity, peculiarity of bodily perception. The objects of this sense are private to each perceiver. Nothing mysterious is meant by this. Attention is simply being called to the fact that bodily perception informs each of us of what is going on in his body and nobody else's. Our fields of view can overlap. We can hear the same sound, smell the same smell, taste and touch the same object. But I cannot feel the motion of your limbs or the distensions of your stomach by my bodily perceptions. So that is the privacy of the bodily senses, but not that your sensations, uh, empirically speaking, um, are, are private. Th this is no difference for, for vision and, and audition. Okay, in, in respect of this sense, we really are locked up inside our bodies. Or to put it in a more cheerful way, we have a privileged access to information about our own body, namely also from inside and not, al not only from outside. You can touch other bodies, you can see other bod bodies, but you cannot proprioceive other bodies. Okay, um, I think this is what I say there. Oh, and surprisingly <laughs> for myself, I'm at the end of my talk already. This is the, these are the sources of the pictures I have used. And um, now I'm looking forward to your question, questions and the, the discussion. Thank you. I think Senior was the first. I will give the microphone to you now, and then I will ask you to pass it around. Yes. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Marcus, uh, for this um, introductory lecture that uh, indeed helps uh, to situate us, right? And I really appreciate also the philosophical approach um, to the topic. And um, so building up further, so on uh, the rhetoric, right, and the, the topic uh, you picked um, for um, this first talk, what is proprioceptive art? I'd like to ask um, how could we consider the other types of questions about proprioceptive art? And first of all, why proprioceptive art? Why proprioceptive art? Well, um, there, there, is, there, there could be an autobiographic answer to that. 
and there could be a philosophical answer to or, or an art um, uh, arty uh, answer answer to, answer to that. Um, I think I go for the official philosophical and uh, art uh, answer and uh, uh, spare you the autobiography um, this time uh, um, at dinner <laughs> for, for, for that. Um, well, it's just the, it was my observation that uh, proprioception, the, all the bodily senses enter into the art world. Of course, we had that beforehand. First of all, in visual arts, we will learn uh, from Juliana later that visual art already was meant to trigger proprioceptions. So it has been the case in the background all the time, of course. And in the 60s with fluxes and happening art, uh, our bodies were involved in art already. But I think it has a new quality nowadays in the last decade or in the last 20, maybe 25 years, where we are not only participants and thereby the material of the artwork, um, just some bodies of, of recipients of museum goers um, are also the material integrated into the artwork. But the, the switch is that we shall be aware really of what is going on in, in our bodies in, inside. So the view from inside is now on, on proprioception. And this is just an observation that this is the case. On our website, we have many more examples of that, or also in art schools, you can see that, that students present their masterpieces, which are proprioceptive pieces. You have slides there as well, or ropes from which, where you can swing through the, the room, etc. So it's just the observation that it's happening. And I thought that um, a theoretical approach to it might be useful and also interesting. So this is uh, the genesis of the, of the, uh, the question. Question, is proprioception one sense, in brackets, one sense modality, namely the sense of feeling one's own body, or is it a bunch of different senses corresponding to the different types of information we get, as you explained, which, uh, which concern the same object, our body? Um, and is there a technological, uh, or sorry, is there a terminological issue, or is it a substantial issue, what do you think? I, I would guess that uh, you could make further differentiations. You could speak about interoceptive art, vestibular systems art, and, um, and proprioceptive art, narrowly speaking. I think you could do that. So it, it is, the bodily senses are truly a bunch of, of, different, of different senses, or at least you have different, different receptors. And so you could be even more fine-grained and ask the question, is there thermoceptor uh, art? which just triggers your thermal sections, um, could be. But I think that these senses are, that would be too fine-grained. And so my belief is that um, uh, having bodily senses and the unifying factor is that it's information about what is going on inside our skin. Um, this being the unifying factor and um, uh, this is, this is uh, broad enough and fine-grained enough to talk about a new category of art next to visual art and, um, and auditory art. To go more fine-grained is possible, but I think thermal art or pain art is, is just too small to be uh, complex enough. That would be my hunch that, that this, this is so. I just heard that Otil said that it should work now and Jiri has actually a second question just lined up. So let's give it another try. Fingers crossed. Uh, so the, um, uh, the second question was um, about, so, so many, several times in your talk, you said something like uh, an installation is a proprioceptive artwork. And uh, just to be clear on that, uh, can we really say that an installation is a proprioceptive artwork? Shouldn't we say, just to be clear maybe, that an installation is something which can, in the right circumstances, give rise or trigger a proprioceptive artwork, say, in the person who slides the slider, uh, but that the installation itself is not a proprioceptive anything. So it cannot be a proprioceptive artwork. Uh, proprioceptive something is, is a mental entity. So a proprioceptive artwork has to be a mental entity. It cannot be an installation. Again, maybe this is just, you know, uh, a terminological thing, but um, just to be clear, clear on that. 
Um, thanks for this question. It's very important. I used to think about the net um, or the slides um, in that I uh, uh, formulate the following metaphor. The, the, the slides or the, the nets are like instruments who make it sound proprioceptively in our bodies. So in, with this metaphor, indeed, um, the net or the slides, the installations, wouldn't be the artwork, but they are the instruments. Or think of film, um, the old, not, not digital film, but film rolls, yeah, reels. Um, they are the material that can make, uh, that, that, that can cause visions. And the same with a, with a net. The net could be like a film roll, a reel, um, um, like, like that. that. That's what I used to think. But I think that, um, prop, I mean, the, the visual artwork, Mona Lisa, is also oil on canvas. It's a material thing. It is not vision itself. So also there is some interaction going on. But still, we would call Mona Lisa the realization of the artwork. And so um, I'm, I'm not sure anymore how to, how to talk about, uh, about the installations. Um, I could conceive of artworks as being, or, sorry, realizations of artworks can be two things and at the same time, physical entities and mental entities. So they, they could be, they, they could live in two ontological realm, realms, the realizations of artworks. That would be an opportunity. Maria Reicher has this approach, for example, where it can be both. But Jiri, uh, thanks for this question. It's, it's one of the very important um, follow-up questions, what the installation is. Does it belong to the realization of the artwork, or is it the instrument um, which causes the proper perceptions in us? I'm not sure uh, on, on that yet, but thank you. Okay, next we have Elisa Calderola. So thanks for the great talk. Um, my question is actually uh, related to, to the last question we heard. And um, so it seems to me that um, from what you said, we can conceive of prop art uh, as uh, what some philosophers of art would call an art genre more than an art form. An art genre being uh, a category that can encompass works with the indifferent art media, like for instance, works of installation art, work, works of architecture, uh, what we could call maybe uh, first person performances, like works where we ourselves, the public are asked to dance, etc. And uh, so in this sense, the category of proprioceptive art would be similar to say the category of comedy that can encompass movies and novels and theater plays, etc. And I think, uh, so if you agree with, uh, with uh, this point, uh, this perhaps might, uh, might help you uh, finding a solution for your first uh, <coughs> problem. So, so, sorry, when, uh, sorry the to problem. interrupt, I have to, I have to repeat the yeah. question for the audience here because it was only me who could hear you. Yeah, so the idea is great. The idea was to say it's not an art form, but it's an art, an art genre. Uh, proprioceptive art could be an art genre. Um, for the reason that it can be, um, as, as far as I understood the, the, the question, I hope I, I understood it correctly, because it is uh, so uh, realizable in so many different uh, media forms, uh, as in um, performances, participations, or in installations, etc., it might be better to call it a genre rather than um, in, uh, an art form. Is, th is this what, is, uh, did I uh, correctly understand your, your question? And thanks for this question. I, I don't have an answer yet, but it makes me think about, it makes me think about it. Genre versus, versus art form, and I have to, uh, I have to uh, do some follow-up reading on, on, this, on this difference. So, thanks a lot for this, for this question. Now, Should we take um, the follow-up on yeah, uh, you, yeah, because we, we don't have anyone else on the list so far? I think there so. are some people in the, in the audience Oh, here really? Well. Sorry, did I miss you? But, uh, but let's have the follow-up and then Charles. Okay. So what I wanted to add is that if you, if you think of proprioceptive art in terms of an art genre, this might perhaps help you solve the, the emotions problem you mentioned at some point. Because you m might perhaps m simply uh, claim that, uh, well, you know, 
um, since proprioceptive art is an art genre, it might be that uh, to some degree works in a wide variety of genres have a certain degree of, uh, of a proprioceptive character to them. And then what is relevant is really how uh, significant this degree is. You know, one could write uh, a novel uh, whose main uh, field is pretty tragic and still have, you know, limited comedic uh, episodes within it. And, and perhaps uh, you could have, I don't know, uh, a, a painting that has a limited proprioceptive dimension to it. And I think, yeah, this is an analogy that could help you solve that issue perhaps. And then okay, uh, there's other stuff concerning the ontology of artworks, but there's no related to the art form, uh, art genre distinction, but there's no time to I, I think we will have to leave it at thanks. that. So Marcus, Absolutely. the chance to, to answer, please. So many thanks for your, for your suggestions. I will really uh, uh, think about um, uh, calling it a, a genre, and that might solve also the problem with, um, with emotions. So yeah, thanks for the for the material to think about. Great, thank you. Okay, then we come to Charles now. Uh, so I'm not sure I've got an entirely well formulated question, but I'll give it a go. Um, taking up on your suggestion, where we know visual art when we see it, we wouldn't be able to appreciate the Mona Lisa with our eyes closed, uh, at least not as the author intended it. Um, and then I sort of wonder what would happen if you put um, color music in the Mona Lisa's place as sort of paintings or, or, or light shows that were intended to trigger hearing or sound. Uh, in that case, is that still a, a, a visual artwork? Or if you didn't have your hearing, would you appreciate the work as uh, the artist intended? Um, yeah. So that leaves me th thinking that maybe as well as for proprioceptive art to be intended by the author, that proprioception is stimulated directly or indirectly. It's also the case that it needs to be effective, that they succeed in their goal. It's not enough just to intend it to be the case, um, that they ha actually have to deliver, at least in some of the experiences. Wow. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Is, is uh, success uh, necessary? Um, well, I, I don't know the answer, but let me improvise. Um, suppose someone, suppose Leonardo has a second version of Mona Lisa, but never intended to show it to anyone. Uh, I mean, wasn't sure about it, stored it in, in the cellar, and as a matter of fact, never showed it to anyone and burned it at one point. Now, was it a visual artwork or not? I think it, it was, even if it didn't succeed to trigger any vision, simply because he, he took it back, but he primarily, first of all, he intended it to be a visual artwork. So I, I would think that success, I mean, it's best if there is success, <laughs> but it's not necessary. I wouldn't inscribe it into the definition that there is success. Um, now, for your light show or with, uh, with, with the light and sound, um, as I said, um, um, it's visual art, auditory art, proprioceptive art, smell, taste art, right, etc. Uh, these are not categories which are um, exclusive. So one and the same artwork can be all of that at the, at the same time. If the relevant components are essential to um, appreciate that, that artwork. That is always the important bit, um, not accidental smells or so. Um, they have to be intended, right? Um, so your, your visual auditory piece would be both. It would be an auditory and a visual piece, and maybe also to a degree a proprioceptive piece, if it does not only happen accidentally that there are proprioceptions, but if they are intended by the by the author. Okay, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for a discussion. Oh, so let's perfect. thank our speaker again. Uh, everyone here is, of course, invited to go on with the discussion or get a coffee. And yeah, we'll see each other at um, 
half past. Thank you.